Welcome to Boost Your Employability, a CIM Marketing Club session. Uh, my name is Johnny Crawley and I am Learner Partnership Manager at the Chartered Institute of Marketing and I'm your host for the session. So uh, for today's session, we're really lucky to be joined by two expert marketers, um, Helen Petworth and Vicky Smith, who have agreed and are kind enough to share their top tips and some guidance on getting into marketing as a career their marketing career stories, category management, retail storytelling, what brand management is and isn't, and how CIM helps them with their careers. So a bit of background about Helen and Vicky. So Helen is founder of Collective Stories. She's a strategic storyteller, uh, not just in the once upon a time sense, but in 2019, after a grand career adventure working in multinational fast moving consumer goods suppliers, supporting some of the largest retailers in the world. Helen founded Collective Stories. It's an FMCG category management consultancy. So Helen, using her talents and insight, creative storytelling and commercial skills, has built Collective Stories from the ground up to help FMCG suppliers craft the right story to achieve and maintain listings in the UK retailers. First to admit it, Helen rejects blandness and loves impactful stories, particularly strategic stories, delivered in the most creative and possible ways. Helen's an active regional board member of the CIM and having completed her CIM postgraduate diploma in 2003. Vicky is co-founder and director at Alante Marketing and a strategic marketing consultancy that specializes in helping startups and small and medium-sized enterprise with their brand strategy. She spent the last 20 years working across big and small brands, including Lurpak, Anchor and Cravendale, Blackstone Free and Ainsley Harriet Foods. She's also worked with industry bodies such as Organic Trade Board, Dairy UK to develop industry-wide campaigns. Vicky also holds a CIM professional certificate and postgraduate diploma. So Marketing Club, what is it? Um, so initially it was created primarily to support students from their um, CIM accredited degree and prepare them for a career in marketing. Um, the events are typically available to CIM members. Other marketing practitioners are welcome to attend as well. Um, CIM accredited degree program enables students to gain a professional marketing qualification and taking advantage of their module exemptions the CIM accredited degree provides. So if your university or uh, degree or program is accredited by CIM, you can fast track your way to CIM qualification. And also I'll be available um, at the end of the presentations to answer any questions that you may have around that. If you're a student, you can sign up to our free of charge CIM newsletter. Each edition of CIM newsletter will provide you with content designed to support your studies and actively manage your professional development by keeping you up to date with the latest trends, innovations and concepts in the marketing industry. If you haven't already grabbed the QR code on the screen, we'll send you a link and the QR code and you can sign up to that after today's event. So before we get started with this afternoon's presentations, I'd just like to mention that you can download a copy of the presentation slides that we'll be going through and any reading resources relevant to today's session. They'll only be available to download whilst we're broadcasting, so please make sure if you are interested in that, do download them now before the session finishes. And we'll be recording the webinar, which will be available to watch again on demand in a few days via the Graduate Gateway webpage and CIM YouTube channel. The presentations will last for about 45 minutes and you'll be able to interact by submitting any questions that you have as part of um, a Q&A session that we will do our best to, to answer those questions at the end of, of the presentation. So please do interact with us, drop those into the chat um, and you'll be able to do this by clicking on the question mark, which you'll find on the right hand side of your screen. So if you're watching on a laptop, that's on the right hand side of your screen. If you'd like to share any thoughts on today's session on social media, then you can do that by using the hashtag that's on the screen. So that's the hashtag CIM events, which you can see on the screen right now. So I'd like to hand over to our guest speakers, Helen Hepworth and Vicky Smith. Um, so over to you, Vicky. Hi, thank you for the introduction. Um, so my name's Vicky. It's actually Murray Smith, my maiden name, but there's a very strong chance that I um, I gave you that because I 
quite frequently refer myself to myself as Smith still. Um, so uh, CIM had asked me to come and talk a little bit about my career path to you guys and, and, and how I've kind of um, navigated through the world of marketing and also a little bit about brand management and the role of brand management um, and, and to give you some tips and advice around the kind of core competencies for, for that discipline that, that you, you'll want to look at how you can demonstrate when you're going to interviews. So I guess just to, to kick off, in, in terms of how I started my career in marketing, probably pretty similar to, to where you guys are now. So I did, a, um, this is me 22 years ago, looking quite fresh faced. Um, I did a degree and then a master's in marketing and I did my CIM advanced certificate and post-grad um, certificates as part of those qualifications, um, which I think is what, what Johnny was just talking about. Um, so, and now I run, um, as Johnny had already said, a, a strategic marketing and brand consultancy called Atalante and we specialize in startups um, and we actually actively campaign for better representation of women in marketing. And before that, I spent the last sort of seven or eight years, really started that just before Christmas. Um, and I spent the last seven or eight years working for Arla across some of the, um, in my opinion, most exciting brands in the UK, including Anchor, Lurpak, uh, Skia and, and Cravendale. But in terms of how I got there, uh, Johnny, would you mind just going to the next slide? Try not to think about your career in marketing as being quite linear. I think if you just, you know, you just progress in quite a specific channel to more and more senior job titles actually you can miss out on really kind of getting a breadth of rich experience that kind of can enrich your cv and, and, and basically make you a better marketer and i think some of the twists and turns in my career have helped me do that and also helped me really figure out what i wanted to do long term so in terms of where i started i actually didn't want to work in marketing to start with um, i wanted to be a tv journalist and i um, spent quite a lot of time getting work experience on tv programs in newspapers um, and I had a, a, a degree uh, lined up to, to study TV, film, theatre and literature. Um, and basically what happened is my um, my boyfriend at the time failed all his A-levels and I went with him to a career session to, to try and help him um, work out what he was going to do next. And I got chatting with a marketing lecturer um, and um, it, it, it sounded pretty interesting. It's not something I'd really considered before. I'd, I'd got a summer job working in a PR agency and I was really enjoying it. And so I actually decided to defer my marketing, my um, my degree place and um, carry on working in the PR agency and start a marketing degree. Uh, and I was actually thinking eventually I'll go back to the other degree. I'll just do it to learn a bit about it um, in the interim. Um, but really enjoyed it, really enjoyed working for the PR agency, really enjoyed the degree. And when it got to the year, I decided actually um, I I'm going to carry on with the marketing degree. I'm really interested in it. Um, and I'll, um, I'll 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 complete that, and then I'll do my journalistic qualifications. So I then I then moved into a role as a press officer for Doncaster Council, which probably doesn't sound that sexy on the surface, but actually I arrived at Doncaster Council right in the middle of what is still one of the largest ever public um, local authority corruption scandals on my first day when I went to meet the, the leader of the council, he got arrested dramatically um, and people got arrested every day. We had floods, we had crises and um, it actually ended up being a very interesting um, experience working there. Um, but kind of after I'd been there a couple of years, um, I kind of, and I'd, by this point I'd been doing my marketing degree for two or three years, I kind of had decided, actually I'm not sure I want to do journalism and press anymore. Um, I think that actually I'm quite interested in, in FMCG, fast moving consumer goods, which Helen's going to talk about in a bit, um, and brands and marketing, and that's more what I want to do. So. I kind of um, what I started to do then was apply for graduate schemes for Diageo, Coca-Cola, all those kinds of businesses. Um, and at this point, I was still only 21 because I actually did my degrees at night and I worked full time at the same time. So I had work experience, but I was still only 21. I was still only the same age as, as all the other graduates in my sort of cohort. Um, but what I heard time and time again was we're, that <clears throat> we're not interested in you because you've already been working. We want people that we can mould um, and you've already got experience and you don't have a degree from a Red Brick University. Um, so I kind of thought, well, I just have to find another way to get there. So I, um, I started to try to look for jobs that would give me broader and broader experience to get me into a more of a marketing role. I moved to an in-store shopper agency as their PR manager called Bezier. I worked my way up to communications manager there. Um, I then wanted to sort of broaden again into sort of broader marketing skills. Um, a lot of the recruitment agents I spoke to said to me, no, you've chosen PR now. That's your area. It's going to be very difficult for you to get into any kind of marketing job. You should continue on your PR route. 
um, a job came up at a local radio station for a marketing manager, which I thought sounded like fun. I knew I was already on the back foot, so I applied directly and I sent a really creative um, application in, which I'd encourage you to think about. I, I basically recorded my CV onto cassette tapes, which you're all probably too young to even know what they are. Um, but the, the radio station's uh, slogan at the time was 80s, 90s, now um, music so um, and I themed my CV and all my experience around albums from those eras I got an interview I got the job I um, had a fantastic time there I got promoted to marketing uh, group sort of regional marketing director um, across all of the Yorkshire stations and it was really kind of the dream job I was um, doing uh, sponsorship deals with sports clubs um, kind of running big concerts and events um, all manner of, of advertising and communications and, and fantastic role um, unfortunately the um, the group of radio stations like most radio stations um, became networked so that meant they, they no longer had local stations they were broadcasting everything from a national station so all the regional roles were made redundant I was completely devastated um, really didn't you know I, could, I really didn't know what to do next I um, I could have gone into another senior role at that point because I obviously I had the title and I'd, I'd been sat on the board um, but I actually decided I, I was going to have another crack at trying to get into brand and FMCG so I um, again went to recruitment agents none of them would put me forward for um, for FMCG brand roles because they said I didn't have a classical FMCG background so I thought well I'll, I'll figure my own way out again so I um, applied for an interim role at uh, Betty's and Taylor's um, to cover the market the marketing director was um, seconded to run Betty's by Tech Post uh, the marketing director was actually Tamden Daniel who's now my business partner and that's how I met her so that was one fantastic thing to come out of that um, but I took over as marketing manager there and an interim contract and I learned all the skills that I was missing from a from a brand management point of view. I learned about product development and briefing, pricing, promotions, uh, the elements that I perhaps hadn't experienced in some of my other roles. And that really then enabled me to then move into what is more classic FMCG role. So I moved to a small brand owner called Symington's as a brand manager on Ainsley Harriet. Um, really enjoyed that, grew that brand 15% um, in, in a year or so, um, and then moved to, um, saw a role come up at Arla um, for a brand manager on their lacto-free brand, which is quite a small brand, a bit of a sideways move, but I thought it was a good opportunity to get some fresh um, FMCG experience, took that role did really well on that got them sort of double digit growth over a couple of years put my hand up to um, work on a satellite project to um, explore how Arla could launch into the yogurt category where they didn't have a, a presence um, and nearly killed me did that project alongside my other job and out of that was launched Arla Scare and Protein which was worth 16 million within its first year and continued to drive significant incremental growth for Arla that got me a promotion so um, I became the senior brand manager on Cravendale um, uh, which is a, a big milk brand that brand had been in decline for um, seven or eight years um, and within a year I got it into 10% growth um, which got me another promotion so then I um, uh, worked on Anchor Butter and took that over again Anchor Butter had, had had quite a challenging time the, it had a lot of a lot of problems going on it wasn't making money it was it had been dec declining in terms of say it was making money but it, the profitability was down it had been declining in terms of sales and the creative was was not working um and i did a big project to redevelop the brand strategy for that brand and all the creative strategy and turned it around from 17 percent decline to 17 percent growth within a year and the strategy is still continue to drive year on year growth for it so that's been great I then got promoted to look after all of the butters and spreads category for Arla so I was the senior branding category manager so managing Lurpak, Anchor um, and, and the own label products again absolutely sort of made it that's kind of what I wanted to do it was brilliant uh, by this point I'd obviously spent quite a bit of time working on uh, big brands over the last sort of eight years or so um, and decided I really wanted to go back into a small brand where I could really make a difference with some of this fantastic experience that I gathered and so I took a role as a head of marketing in a small brand I did, I, at that point I decided I didn't really want to go into a director role where I was managing people I like doing marketing I want something still quite hands-on um, and that ended up being a bit of a disaster for me I um, just had a massive personality clash with the MD and the, the business um, didn't really reflect my values and I didn't enjoy it there I stayed for a very short amount of time uh, took a bit of time to regroup went back to Arla did an interim contract and then decided to set up my agency which which we've been doing for the last um 
six months maybe longer now and absolutely loving it so i think um i guess all i'm saying to you is when you're thinking about what you want to do you don't need to pick a specific discipline i would when you're looking at the different roles that you want to move to i would always try to have a look at a something that you're going to enjoy and feel passionate about because ultimately you'll make it work if that's how you feel about it and when you're kind of looking at what your next job is i would just encourage you to keep looking at your cv and looking at where your skill gaps are and what role can you take that's going to help you fill those skill gaps skill gaps rather than being focused on just necessarily getting a peg up because that ultimately will make you a better marketer and get you further in the end um so that's a kind of a brief well not so brief history of my career and and how i got to to where i am so i guess um in terms of brand management i'm going to talk about five things i think it is and 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 therefore the things that you need to be able to demonstrate um competencies around when you're going for interviews if you want to work in this area and, and five things it isn't so I think the first thing is that for me brand management is a very commercial job you're essentially responsible for the P&L of your brand and if you want to be taken seriously in the boardroom and you want to be able to be the person making the decisions that's going to make a difference to the growth of your brand and also if you want to be able to get get budgets in the first place and then have autonomy and control over them you really need to know your numbers and be prepared to spend quite a lot of time looking at category data and sales data and working with category team and, fan and I've worked with Helen, fantastic people like Helen that can really help you understand um, your brand health and what's driving your performance. And that's becoming really au fait with systems like Nielsen, Kantar, Dunhumby, Millwood Brown and understanding how to use them and, and, and how that data works. Um, your job as a brand manager primarily is to figure out what's happening with your brand and what's driving your performance. So, you know, is it is it that you're getting new customers? Is it um, is it through loyalty? Are people just buying you more frequently? What's driving your performance? And where are your customers going and coming from? What brands are they moving out to? What brands are they coming in from? And what's driving that change? Is it something tactical like a promotion or is it kind of long term category changes and trends like veganism or ethics that like which was a, a massive issue? As you can imagine for dairy um, and what plan are you going to put in place to 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 then resolve that longer term it's also kind of understanding not just your sales but also your profitability so you know as you remember when i was on lacto-free um cheese lacto-free cheese for example was three percent of our sales and very volume driven business so it's also said well, maybe we should just forget the cheese it's only three percent of our sale it's a bit of a waste of time uh, you know and, and you need to in that moment be able to say yeah but it's 25 percent of our profit so i don't think we should be getting rid of it and actually we need to look at how we can make it a big part of the portfolio so I, I guess what I'm saying is if you want to work in brand management I think you just need to be prepared to prepared and able to really get comfortable with data and most people that come in um, as assistant brand managers or, or sort of new don't feel that comfortable with that and it takes them time to, to get used to it but I'd really encourage you to do that and also think about when you're going for interviews how you can demonstrate that you're used to handling data and analyzing data because it's a huge part of the role and if you rely on other people to do it which you can do you can work with fantastic category people that can give you some of that data and insight um, but it, it's really good to actually get to grips with it yourself because quite often that's where you might spot something from a different perspective that somebody might not have seen so the first thing is knowing your numbers, getting comfortable with data and being able to demonstrate that in interviews is really important to brand management. The next thing um, um, is around insight, not information. So yeah, I've just talked a lot about the numbers, but what I would say is it's about understanding what's driving numbers and not just regurgitating them. So brand management is about insight, not information. That's a phrase I've nicked from Arla that they, they talk about quite a lot. So it's, it's ultimately about what are the numbers and data telling you about consumer behaviors and consumer needs um, and, and, what, and, and how, that is, you know, how that's impacting your brand and what corrective action that you need to take. So, um, um, for example, when I worked in um, in butter, um, kind of a big issue for us is that you know 70 this might got these these numbers will have changed, but something like 70% of people that eat buy butter, block butter, traditional butter are over 60, and that ratio is increasing each year. But those people are eating more butter. Um, so when you look at your sales on the surface, your sales are growing in the short term and over the last few years, it looks great. But actually, when you start to dig around those trends, like what is that what's going to happen then to your brand in, in 30 years time if you don't do something to bring new consumers in? And that's where you kind of really digging underneath the data to figure out what's happening and what action you need to take longer term to keep your brand 
growing before it, it gets to a point where you're just into decline and then it's it, it's a long-term game to to um, retract that and and the way that you then do that if you've spotted those trends it's then around you know insight and insight and research for me is is really the lifeblood of, of brand management so it's really that how do you understand why consumers what consumers are the, the data tells you what they're doing but why are they doing it so um putting an emphasis on commissioning research and even if you work on a small brand where you've not got budget just go and talk to people and just figure out you know in the in the butter example why are young people not eating butter what are they doing instead what's driving is it health is it ethics what is it that's driving it and really understand that so you know i, I guess um, the, the second thing then linked to the first point is that, that you know, brand management is really, as with all types of marketing, is really about looking behind, but constantly looking behind the numbers and trying to understand what your consumers are doing and thinking and why, and then what you can do to, to better meet their needs and, and, and better align to that. The third thing, let me just move to the next slide, is around being the guardian of the positioning. So I think a somewhat obvious one but I guess I used to think that it was my job to come up with a positioning for a for a brand and actually um positioning is 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 pretty simple it, you know it's it's what is the, the the defining product attribute of your product and then what functional emotional needs does that mean for who and it really that's not something you can make up it's just there and you just need to figure out what it is you need to go and speak to the, to the previous point you need to go and figure out speak to consumers and figure out what that is um, and, and that's your job as a as a as a brand manager or, or a, a senior brand manager to work out what that is and then hold everybody to it. And, and that's not just about I think there's a lot of confusion between creative strategy and positioning. And actually positioning is quite dull. So if you look at Coca-Cola's positioning statement, it's something like um, we are a high quality beverage business. All our beverages are refreshing and that that. Um, enhances the um and, uh, the lives of our consumers and makes them feel happy and that's their positioning statement but what you see is their creative strategy so the uh, taste the freshness or, or whatever strap line they're using at the time the red the the fun and, and the sort of distinctive assets and i think there's a big distinction between when you're a brand manager it's not your job to come up with that stuff it's your job to come up with the positioning and the strategy and then hold everything else to it so an easy mistake to make is when you're getting great creative through and you see a really exciting campaign and you think oh, i just love it it's going to be fantastic but it's about really asking the hard questions around is that absolutely going to appeal to my consumer is the is the thing that it's talking about completely linked to my strategy to the benefit that i'm and, and the consumer needs that i'm trying to meet and it's not just doing that with comms it's doing that with everything you do when you when you're having an argument with commercial around promotional or pricing strategy does that link in with the consumer you're targeting and how they use the product and what they're prepared to pay um, when you're looking at developing new products it's holding anything that you develop or if you're changing packaging to that strategy and that's your job you're the guardian of the positioning you're not you're the voice of the consumer and you should be so close to your consumers and understand them so well that you can almost speak on their behalf and that's your job not to make up that stuff just to understand what your consumer's perspective is and keep all elements of of the brand and marketing um on board with that strategy so that's the third thing and then the fourth thing is around getting people on board so brand management is kind of ultimately then about getting people on board so you can have the best product and brand strategy in the world but if you can't if you can't persuade your grumpy operations director to make it for you because it's going to be a bit of a, a pain to have to change something on his line or you can't get your salespeople to go out and sell it to you when they're, speak, when they're speaking to clients or you can't get the retailer to list it or indeed you can't get your ceo to give you the budget to support your plans then it's never gonna go anywhere and such a huge part of the job is around having strong communication skills and interpersonal skills and being able to communicate ideas in a simple and compelling way that will get people on board with them and make them want to um, to support you and make stuff happen. Um, and I think when you particularly when you're going for interviews for brand management roles, that's something that, 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 that people are really going to be looking for because it's such an important part of the job, having strong persuasive skills and being able to get people on board with, with your strategy and what you want to do, because quite often you're the person giving the slightly uncomfortable news that either if we don't do something about this and that's going to require a change and it's going to cost some money this is what's going to happen to your sales and it's again when all those other things I've just talked about in terms of the data and the sales all needs to be 
brought together to create compelling arguments for why you need budget or why you want to launch a product or why a retailer should list you. So getting people on board, I think, is, a, is the fourth kind of um, most important thing or element of, of brand management. And then number five. So, and then number five, probably an obvious point, um, but, but a bit of a stumbling block is just making it happen. So, um, again, you can have all those like shiny plans and products, but brand management isn't just about kind of coming up with like fun advertising and the strategy. It's about making it happen. And, and the job isn't done until the product's on the shelf or indeed in the consumer's shopping basket and on the way home. And all the upfront planning bit can be quite energizing, but actually then after you've done that bit, there's the new line forms to fill in to make sure it gets, it actually gets installed as the um, managing rosters of agency after they've done the fun presentation to actually make them deliver the things that they said they would deliver. There's setting up the barcodes, there's going to an industrial site in Leicester at 3 a.m. in the morning to sign off your packaging when it comes off the print run and standing on the end of the um, production line as the product comes off the shelf to make sure it's being packed correctly in the SRP so that it's going to be facing the consumer when they come out. And they're the things, those little things, managing those things are what gives you a successful launch and ultimately gets your product selling. Um, and I think that there's there's a real, when people are recruiting for brand managers, they're looking for people with excellent product management skills because um, and project management skills, because it's not just about having a great strategic mind, being able to do all that upfront stuff that we just talked about and the commercial stuff. It's also about having the tenacity and the project management skills to, to actually make it happen and manage it through. And when you come across obstacles, which you absolutely will, making figuring out a way to to overcome them and make it happen in terms of briefly the five things that i think often people think it is that it isn't um just on the next thank you um i think um one is sort of champagne and agency so i think some people think that when you move into like a brand management job particularly on a a sexy brand or a big brand it's going to be all kind of like madman you're going to be kind of um um having the like drinks trolley coming around at four o'clock and it's really not like that usually in 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 fast in fmcg in particular you're in a kind of bit of a basic office attached to a warehouse quite often um and you do do a bit of agency stuff but it's a small part of the job and I think all the stuff I've talked about before um, it is kind of what the bulk of the role is. I think a lot of people think that it's all about communications and it's absolutely not. Communications is part of it um, but really it's only kind of a small part of it and, and you know and sometimes now even digital communications is only a part of that part. Communications is about 25% of your job if that it's doing all the other stuff, the MPD, the, um, the all the things that I've just talked about um, in terms of making the role work. Um, I think that people think that to be a brand manager or work in marketing, you have to be kind of really creative and come up with out there ideas. And I would just say that it's more about problem solving so than, than zany out there ideas. It's about coming up with ways to solve a problem. And that might be how you communicate to a, um, to a market or how you can refocus on a different audience to grow your brand. Um, but it might be just about how are you going to position something or talk about it in order to get a buyer to list it. Um, if you run out of an ingredient or something like that, how can you pivot your product in a different way to overcome those kinds of issues and problems? Um, the, the fourth one in terms of secondary to sales, I think that sometimes in some businesses, and I think if you find yourself in a business where you feel that your role is secondary to sales, um, I'd, I'd evaluate whether you want to stay that. Marketing, in my opinion, should drive the business. It's what sets the strategy. It should be what's setting the direction for what's sold. Um, and, and it should be the voice of the consumer. And that should be leading what sales are going out and selling rather than something that's secondary um, to sales and commercials. And also, if you're doing a good enough job about of managing your numbers and making sure you're growing, that'd be less of an issue anyway. Um, and I think the fifth thing is sometimes I've often still hear people talk about um, brand management as the kind of cutting out and colouring in department. And I think there's just something around also that kind of it, it's not about that. And codes, visual codes and distinctive assets are a really important part of building a brand. You know, where would Coke be without the Coke logo and the red? It's the way that you instantly know what brand you're talking about. And there's something around when people make those kinds of comments just sort of making sure that people are aware of that and how important that stuff is because that stuff has a value on the balance sheet at the end of the day if you create equity in in, in your codes and assets it has a commercial value for your brand you know in terms of as, as well as sort of helping with recognition and so on 
So um, yeah, I guess uh, briefly, that's my kind of summary um, of, of five things I think brand management is and five things it isn't. Um, you know, I think that, you know, in summary, brand management is a strategic function um, and it should lead the business and, and where it's going and where products are going and, and what the comms is saying, your pricing, your selling, you know, you, and everything. So um, it's vitally important and there is still nowhere else I'd rather be in terms of my career. I still love working on brands and brand management. Um, so yeah, that's that's my kind of um, quick guide to brand management. I guess um, just to close, um, uh, just on the final slide, um, Johnny asked me to just sort of cover off how CIM helped my career. Um, so um, I think that there's kind of um, four key ways, really. I think the first one is around practical application. So um, and, and when I'm recruiting for brand managers or, or marketing assistants in the past, I, I, I look for people that have got CIM qualification over whether they've got a marketing degree. And that's because CIM, I think, is around actually giving you the skills to apply the things that the sort of marketing theory in a practical way. And when I did my first CIM qualification, I failed my first module I failed it and I was in absolute shock I'd never even done badly academically at anything before and when I kind of got some coaching about that I realized it's because I was still talking in a very theoretical theoretical way about using some theory or some model and actually see I am's about well this business has got this problem what are you going to do to fix it and that actually is going to help you a lot more in the real world than um than, than some of the um than kind of talking about theories and stuff that nobody really understands, particularly when you're trying to get people across the business on board with what you're doing. I think the connections are really valuable. So the people that you meet on a CIM course, or if you come to the events and you go to the, I used to be very involved in the South Yorkshire committee, um, are, are a really helpful peer group for advice, for bouncing ideas off. And also just from a career point of view, they're probably gonna be in organizations that you're potentially interested in. Um, it creates structures and frameworks and a lot of the sort of structures and frameworks for analyzing data or evaluating work uh, are things that I learned on CIM and I still use them now I've adapted them slightly but I still use a lot of those frameworks because it, it makes it easy for um to, to sort of demonstrate your ideas to other people and I think generally also the kind of emphasis on continuous learning so I think that you know we're all still learning I still I'm still constantly trying to read up and find out about things that I don't know about or get new perspectives on marketing from courses and I think that you know CIM is more than just doing the qualification um, and then that's it you know they really are about continuous learning and continually developing because I think with marketing is ever changing but you know the more you know the more you realize you just don't know so um, that's a really great philosophy to have and something that I've tried to uh, continue with throughout my career. Wow, thank you, Vicky. That was brilliant. Um, so as Vicky said, Vicky and I know each other, we've worked together and I can just absolutely testify. Nobody knows brand like Vicky and really does live and breathe. It's her passion. So I'm going to talk to you now about my passion. And I really hope that somebody out there in the in the ether recognises who's on screen now. I wish we had a chat box going for this very reason, because normally I like to interact a little bit. But on the screen now, we've got somebody called Alexis Carrington, who is uh, actually played by Joan Collins, the actress. So I'm going to talk to you now about my awesome 80s, which is basically my journey through CIM, through the world of work and to where I am now and where I hope to go, really. So the 80s unfolded like this for me in 1984. I think I was six. Yeah, I was six. And a TV show came out that completely challenged the way that women were portrayed in the world of work. So. I'll tell you a little bit about Alexis and the fact that she was divorced by her husband for being um, unreasonable. She was a businesswoman. She was a millionaire. But the best thing about Alexis, apart from the fact that she had a phone in her car, I don't know if you can see that, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, she dressed amazingly. She knew what she wanted. And as a six year old, that was really impactful for me because they weren't the role models that I had around me at that time. So I made a decision there that I wanted to be in business, I wanted to be a businesswoman. So throughout my school career, my A-levels, college, et cetera, et cetera, I knew I wanted to go into business. And when I made the decision to do a degree, I still didn't quite know which area of business I wanted to go into. And at this time, in the early 90s, mid 90s, you know, marketing was still not really an academic discipline that was widely promoted. Um, so I did a business studies degree, just general international business, graduated, um, did a placement in an advertising agency in France, 
absolutely amazing. But then when I graduated, I had this sense of working in product development. I worked for, um, if you want to know the specifics of my career, I'm, I've got my QR code coming up. So just stalk me on LinkedIn and you can see where I've been and what I've done and you know the roles that I've had. But one of my very first roles was product development and product development doesn't naturally feel like a marketing role, but it very much is. So I did a postgrad diploma and luckily my degree had qualified because I went to Northumbria had qualified me for exemptions towards the postgrad. So I only had to do, I think it was three modules. And like Vicky, I actually failed one. I was absolutely devastated. I'd never failed anything before in my life, apart from a driving test eight times, but don't judge. Um, I'd never failed anything and I couldn't understand it. And again, just like Vicky, I look back now and I think it's because I wasn't learning the CIM way of practical application and really moving from an academic sense to having more um in the in situation experience and melding the two together so eventually passed found the whole thing incredibly useful made lots of contacts made lots of friends which was great after coming out of uni and my cim qualification then gave me exemptions to do a master's so everything was very fast tracked and allowed me to specialise. So I did a master's in private labels. So I'm going to talk about FMCG in a moment and what it means. But my master's was written about a subject that I was very passionate about and still am. So again, if you want to know the fine minutia of my career, have a look on my LinkedIn profile. But in 2019, I made a decision to step away from industry, um, as in paid employment, and to set up my own agency. So I set up Collective Stories, um, best decision I ever made, moved away from a very commercial role, a very category management centric role and built this agency whereby we go into businesses and we help them get onto retail shelves. But more importantly, with a lot of our clients, we help them to stay there and we help them to grow. We're very, very storytelling focused. We're a creative business. We have an excellent design arm that makes sure as you can see today, everything we do looks beautiful. Our stories are always beautiful. So I founded Collective Stories, which I'll talk more about later on. So as you can see, every single day on that screen indicates that I'm not finished on my journey. And being awarded CIM Fellowship still didn't feel like I was finished. So I'm working towards chartered status, which means I work with um, CIM to submit CPD. So I have to do something that's reflecting all of my learnings that I'm constantly accessing the content on the hub. Um, I use a lot of the CIM content in thought leadership, in storytelling, in creativity, in um, digital video making. I was looking at the other day, which was excellent. You know, I access that all the time because it's constantly building my product. Um, and then in 2021, I was appointed to the board. So I'm a regional active board member, which I've only just started on, but I'm very excited about. And again, I'm not finished. So actually on this slide, Johnny, I am finished. So let's move on to the next one. So FMCG, so Vicky referred to it, I've referred to it. We talk about FMCG all the time. And what you'll notice about both Vicky and I is we absolutely love our industry. I love FMCG, fast moving consumer goods, it's fast, it's exciting, you have to have passion, you have to love your brands. When Vicky was talking, I got a real sense of how much she loved the brands that she'd worked on. And that's important. You need to love what you're going to do. So I want you to take away some points from my rambling today. And I want you to become excited about potential careers in FMCG. This is a personal mission of mine. We have within our region and within the UK, lots of really, really strong and amazing retailers. FMCG means things that we consume daily, things that we buy in supermarkets. It can be butter, it can be toilet paper, it can be Little Moons, which I'll come on to in a second. It can be Colin and Cuthbert. It's things we consume, it's fast, it's exciting. So I just put some hot topics on, on this um, slide now, because again, this is something that constantly I'm not finished I'm always learning about what's going on in my industry and I start trying to keep abreast because I need to know the stories of my industry so that I can build them for my clients so Little Moons is really exciting and if anybody in the audience has kids and has TikTok Little Moons are tiny tiny um 
frozen uh, desserts and they're a TikTok sensation and trying to get hold of them. I must have been to four retailers in a week to get hold of them for my daughter. She doesn't know why she wants them, but TikTok's told her that she should. Um, the second one, the M, is Colin and Cuthbert. So if you haven't, if you've been living under a rock and you've missed the Colin and Cuthbert um, saga that's been going on over the past month, Google it, get on board with that. Think about the wider issues to that story. Why is that story important to our industry? It's m and taking on Aldi, saying, let's stop doing that, stop copying us, stop taking our USPs. It's not right, it's wrong. And, you know, the rebuttals and it's all unfolding on social media in a really interesting way. So, again, something exciting about FMCG. The third one is um, sustainable feminine hygiene products. Massive focus within our industry. You know, we can't go on like this. We can't go on consuming, consuming, consuming. We have to be responsible citizens of this planet we live on. The next one, and I think probably Vicky is better to talk about this one, but this is just something exciting that's going on in the dairy category. That's a different way of melding dairy and oats together for the overnight oat proposition. Very interesting product, very interesting story. Massively recommend that you Google that one if you are in FMCG. The last one, which is actually a question mark. It doesn't have a letter. I just put it on there because I love it. I love the household category. I love the laundry category because what they're always trying to do is think of new ways of selling us new products. Ironing water, a spray that you put on your clothes to stop it wrinkling, 24-hour um, uh, freshness for your clothes. It's constantly extending usage. It's constantly extending products. And how exciting is that? So I hope I've got you fired up about FMCG and what it could be. Now I'm going to explain to you exactly what it is that I do. Next slide, please. So I work in category management and it's always one of those where probably even my family don't really know what I do. But once you get into category management and once you get into FMCG, you will hear about category management and how important it is within a team, within a FMCG business. So brand and category management, very interchangeable. A lot of stuff that Vicky was talking about was nodding, going, that's so right, that's so right. You know, being referred to as the colour in department, we're referred to as the charting service. You know, it's just making sure that you own the job, the role that you're in. You know everything about that role and you know where it fits in and you know what change that you can affect. So let's just go through a few definitions. I'm also a little bit of an academic, but not, not too much. So I've put some good definitions in here that I use all the time. So the first one is what actually is a category. So I mentioned that FMCG is things we use, things we consume, things that we buy in a supermarket and we interact with every day, milk, bread, toilet paper. So a category of those is milk belongs to dairy. It's a distinct manageable group of products that cute consumers consider to be related. Um, Butter also belongs to dairy. Feminine hygiene belongs to personal care. Toothbrushes belong to dental. Nappies belong to baby. You can see where I'm going with this. So how do we manage these groups of categories to make sure that people just aren't going out there and flooding products onto shelf that we don't actually want? How do we work in a smart way? So this is where category management comes along and I'm gonna take you on a little journey of how we got there in a second, but category management describes an arrangement or process whereby instead of just focusing on one brand, we look at every brand within the category. How exciting is that? The thought of looking at a row of soups on a shelf and there's different brands in there and every single one of those different brands has a different role. Every single one of those different brands, those different flavors has a different job to do. That doesn't just happen by accident. It's very scientific. As Vicky said, it's about knowing that customer. It's about knowing what they went, what they want to buy and when they want to buy it. So that definition there is absolutely spot on for me. And then at the end, I've just put, well, why do we do this? Why do we bother the purpose of it? And it's about making sure that we are, as marketeers, we are marketing the right product in the right way to meet the needs of this really complex market. So just a little bit of insight for you there. Next slide, please. So this <laughs> definition is very non-scientific and I've just drawn it out. I love, I love um, a journey. I think it's, it's always the best way. I'm a very visual person, but this brief and non-scientific history of category 
And I've crossed out management there because actually I'm on a little bit of a mini campaign with the word management because management to me infers holding it, looking after it. It doesn't feel dynamic. It doesn't feel like you're doing something with it. It doesn't feel like it's moving on and up. So we refer in our business to category development. It's a small thing, but it's important. We like to be a business that does what we say we're going to do. We live and die by our principles. OK, so cast your mind back to the actual dawn of time. So I refer to this as the age of spray and pray. And this was I love that picture that Vicky put up of Mad Men because that's what it was. It was brands trying to get as much of their product on shelf as they could. So really, really trying to get everything, 15 of their products on shelf, whether it was right for the customer, doesn't really matter. They didn't really care whether it was right for the retailer. Again, zero cares given. They wanted to sell as much as they can. But then as supermarkets became bigger and branches became more and more and more it became very very obvious in the industry that we had to do something and there was a recognition in our industry that we could do better so then we've got what i call the adaptive wilderness where people realized that they needed to do better and in the 80s brian f harris who came up with most of the concepts about category man management and why we needed it he actually said in the 80s we need to be more responsible we need to make sure that we are not just throwing everything onto these shelves uh, but that was in the 80s and probably category management didn't come to the forefront of most retail and SME, uh, sorry, retail and supply businesses until the early noughties. And even then there was a big fight to be had about it. So we did adopt category management practices of reviewing ranges, working with space, speaking to consumers, but pulling all of that together. It was very much a sales driven wilderness out there, a sales driven landscape. Um, and people worked in silos, whereas now we found in the, you know, 2020 and even before that, this feeling in FMCG of actually category management should be at the front because we are really important. We pull together the insight, the story, the commercial aspect of it. So I am a commercial category manager. I will never make a recommendation to my clients that's not going to work out for the client the retailer and the customer, the consumer, that's not what we do. So category management behavior in FMCG has become intuitive. The future is clear. The future is category management. But what we need to make sure is that category management does not become repeating, 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 that it is about telling a story and telling it well and developing this storytelling mindset. Next slide, please. So I've just put on this slide here and I won't go through them all because I'm conscious of time. All of the different things that a category manager will do. So a category manager will review what's going on shelf. They will make sure that they've scooped up the right trends in the market. They will know what's happening with their customers. They are close to the data. We absolutely love data as category managers. We can't get enough of it. It's what we live and breathe by. But we also know how to turn data into a story. We know how to turn data into a strategic vision. We are evolving. We are resilient. And that's why we really fight at Collective Stories to not refer to ourselves as category managers. We are developers. We are evolving. We are constantly challenging. And we do all of this by storytelling. So I'm really conscious with webinars to make your time count. So what I've done on the next slide, please, Johnny. Is pull together my top five storytelling tips. So at the end of this presentation, if you don't remember anything that I said and my jaunty leopard top, you will remember these five top storytelling tips because collective stories, we are storytelling experts. And I just want to get across what how to make a story. And this can be a category management, a category development story, or it can be a brand story, it can be a strategy story any element of marketing that you want to go in it can be a digital story do your story well let's change things let's have a storytelling revolution so the first thing i'm going to talk to you about is clarity if you don't do not know the problem you are trying to solve the product you are trying to sell the issue you are trying to resolve if you don't know it well enough your story will never be clear so have clarity of what you're trying to achieve number two is probably one of my favorites and it's probably the most challenging working with larger businesses and this corporate mindset 
it's avoiding the well-trodden path um, it's making sure that people aren't trotting out insight that is old narratives that aren't changing and i'll give you an example here in the pandemic a lot of my clients would be quite nervous about recommending stuff because all they could hear in the heads were recession 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 you know when they were giving macro insights out as part of the story they'd talk about recessionary pressures and say you know there's a recession coming but actually the pandemic changed on an hourly basis a daily basis you had to be careful about what you said so if you have a narrative a macro level narrative like um okay legislation don't keep trotting it out challenge it make sure it's up to date make sure it's it's excuse me current and that it's not well trodden i would, would really challenge that the third is form and content so form and content well we are a design based agency as well we've got an amazing creative director who makes everything look amazing and challenges poor powerpoint so poor powerpoint to me is something that is cluttered it's not beautiful it's not stylish it's got too much on it so Think about brevity and the economy of words. Hemingway, Hemingway could tell a story in six words. Challenge yourself to do that. Please don't put too much on a slide. If it's a very cluttered slide, it should be a report. If you feel that you've got to have mammoth amount of text on there, it should be a report. It should be sent before or after the presentation. Never, ever, ever lose substance over style. So you might have the most beautiful slide, but still, is it working as hard as it could? The fourth point, again, conscious of time, is the end, okay? So the end of a presentation should never be the end. It shouldn't ever be the end, we've finished, okay, let's go home. It's right, what's next? What do we do now? How can we make this change happen? If you are a good storyteller, you've taken an audience on a journey. So you've started off with the problem and you take them on a journey. And I really like the concept of the hero's um, journey. So Google that if you've got time, so that's very interesting. But the end should actually be the beginning. And again, look at people like T.S. Eliot, who talks about the end and the beginning. Again, really interesting, could talk all day, but won't. So make sure that your end is always, always the beginning of what's next, how do we develop? And then the fifth and final thing is be a fire starter. So I'm hoping that those of you who like 90s musical understand that reference, but if not, bear with me. Um, so throughout your presentation, ignite tiny fires and ignite tiny fires in your audience. So you're never going to get people to do what you want them to do unless you move them unless you emote them unless you start a fire in their belly either by challenging them showing them what could be and how they can do it and how you can help them do it but be a fire starter my last tip is actually related to starting fires and this is something that i've learned from years of working collectively with wider teams if you find you've got a deck that's too big and too unwieldy <clears throat> excuse me burn it down don't be frightened to burn that deck down so that's my top five storytelling tips i hope you've enjoyed them if you've got any storytelling queries at all please come back to me can i have the next slide please so that's me so if you scan the qr code now that'll take you to my linkedin feel free to stalk me you can look at what i've done how i've got to it'll take you to all of the collective stories hashtags and um instagrams etc etc just challenge yourself, if you are in FMCG now, if you are in FMCG category development, category management, and you've got a story, does it have a beginning, a model, and an end? Can we help you unpick it? So that's me. Thank you so much for your time. We're now going to move into a Q&A session. So we've got just over half an hour to take some questions. Okay, yeah, so I suppose this is a question for, for either Helen or, or, or Vicky. Um, I, I know both of you have worked uh, in universities and, and do various guest lectures. So are there any free resources that you could recommend in terms of finding new trends in marketing and, and things that perhaps um, you might be using in, in your everyday life? Um, You're probably more in that stuff than I am at the moment. I'll take this one, um, but I want to talk to you quickly about compost and compost heaps. So. In universities, you have access to libraries and probably access to Mintel, Global Data, MarketLine, Ibis World. You have a librarian attached to, certainly at um, Bleeds Beckett, we have a librarian attached to our business school. So contact your subject librarian and have a look at what they have. 
and it may seem overwhelming because you've got access to this huge database but how we work at collective stories we've got what we call a compost heap and we find things that interest us and we put them on the compost heap and it's the writer neil gaiman who talks about put it in the heap it might not seem relevant now but it will grow and it will develop and it will become something so speak to your top tips speak to your librarian your subject librarian and then start accessing these subjects now start accessing these databases now but write things down because it, something will grow from it vicky any anything to add yeah I, I guess so when i've when i've worked on smaller i mean i'm fortunate when i worked on all of they have huge resources in terms of um data and, and and insight and research but i think that kind of the things that i've done when i've worked on smaller brands and earlier in my career is just go and spend a day at the british library because you then can get free access to lots of reports and and um, on an, almost any topic and usually very good quality up-to-date data so get yourself a british library pass and have a day trip to london um, <clears throat> and the other thing that i would say is just looking on linkedin because actually i learn stuff from linkedin every day people are people are posting great free content uh, helen is a fantastic person to follow she she shares lots of um i love the canto one from today she follow she, she shares lots of great um research reports that she's found and insight and and nuggets of information um so find some people to follow on linkedin that um that are in your area of interest or um your category um and follow them you you, you can get really um easy bite-sized information um i think that way that's that's easy to keep in the grown-up facebook of of linkedin is uh oh, it certainly is the grown-up facebook that's such a good description and <laughs> um, just a, so expanding on from what vicky said so i follow i just one recommendation for you i love uh Cin, is it cindy gallup i love cindy gallup on linkedin she always puts really good stuff on join groups you know make sure that you're following the right hashtags um I'm definitely not a social media expert, but find people who are, you know, just yeah. ask and have a curiosity. Vicky and I think the biggest thing we've got in common is curiosity and we're not finished. Um, so yeah, Johnny, hope we've answered that. Yeah, thank you both. Um, next question is um, about when you're looking for your next job and you're basically uh, encouraged, I can't remember who it was, one of you encouraged, um, listeners to apply for positions that fill your gaps in experience uh, but obviously that's quite a challenge if you don't have the experience and, and you lack that um, particularly for those that um, are, are probably moving from university into their first real job um, I hope nobody takes any, any offense with me saying with first real job but, um, and um, so what, what kind of guidance and advice can you give around that because obviously if you haven't got the experience how do you sell yourself when it comes to a recruitment process yeah i mean i think one of the things i would say is which kind of alludes a bit to, to to what i talked about is don't let other people set your limits for you because actually most jobs are around demonstrating competencies rather than experience so they might ask for experience but what they want to know is that you can do the job so I would think about when you look at a job, think about how can you demonstrate that you can do that and think about what you can send in. Like I talked about the radio example, I've applied for a few jobs like that where you can send something in that's creative and disruptive in terms of your CV and that demonstrates you can do the job. How can you talk about stuff that you've done, whether it's on your course or things that you've done voluntarily um, or you know, if you are kind of um, coaching a sports team or something like that? How can you draw in a creative and, and punchy way, draw some parallels between the stuff I talked about, if you're applying for a band management job, those things that you need to be able to do, show how you, show how, you've, um, uh, how you can do that. So I think there's about, it's about demonstrating competencies and demonstrating passion and tenacity, which I think is what's got me most of my jobs because you know people can see that you care about it and you're gonna make it work. Um, on a practical side, it's probably just about doing some some work experience. I mean, I I, I did plenty of free work experience when I was um, early in my career um, in various places, and actually even now, one of when you, if you can get into an entry level job, in most of the jobs I've done, I've taken on extra responsibilities. I've put my hand up for projects, uh, volunteered for things. I've asked if I could shadow people in other departments. I've asked if I can be involved in projects outside of my 
job that I wasn't getting paid for and I wasn't necessarily getting any credit for but it's meant I can put those things on my CV and it's meant that I've got demonstrable experience then of doing them so there's probably just thinking about all the things in your life that you do whether it's your course or, or your outside interests and how they can demonstrate the right competencies and how you can use that in applications and, and getting some work experience and not being snobby about your first job just getting a job and thinking about how you can um, put your hand up for and, and get involved in projects that help you then get the experience that you need. I don't know if I you've think, to uh, As you were saying that I was like absolutely and do you know what I think for FMCG because let's not forget how much I love FMCG and Vicky loves FMCG. I worked in Morrison's as a 16 year old and as in, in boots and dif different yeah. shops. If you're working in a retail environment now you are in FMCG, so look around you, look at the loyalty cards that people are handing over, look at the way the shoppers are shopping. So I was in the Morrisons that I actually worked in um, the other day and they've refitted it and I was in there for three hours because I was taking photographs, I was looking at the shelves and how they've built this new wellness section, you know, they've got some wooden shelving in there. So be present in your environment and use that on your CV. If you're considering a career in FMCG, go into stores and look at what's happening, tune out the noise and just look around you. And then a top tip I wanted to revisit that Vicky actually said earlier was keeping your CV up to date. Your CV is never, is never never stop. I amend mine all the time. And if somebody says to me, can I see your CV, which does happen, I've got it ready to send. And I think that is so important. Look at your CV, backfill the gaps, um, identify any strengths and keep that as your framework. I think that really helps to focus. Thank you. Um, somebody asked, uh, we've obviously got a fan. Somebody asked if we're recording the session yet. Yeah, we are. Um, it, it's going to be available on the um, U CIM YouTube channel and also on the um, Graduate Gateway webpage on CIM webpage. So um, I'm glad somebody wants to revisit that. Um, we've got a question about um, category management. So um, actually from somebody I know, I hope you're well, uh, Eloise. Um, uh, category management sounds really interesting. What kind of companies or business would you find a category manager would it be an agency or literally within a supermarket team or something else? So it's it's really simple. It's neither of those. It's within a supplier. So so no retailer makes every product that's on their shelves. So every every retailer will have a lemonade supplier, a tomato supplier, a toilet roll supplier. Everything comes from somewhere. So you want to be looking at businesses like Unilever, like Arla, like P&G. But also, let's not forget the smaller suppliers, which is where I started out. And that's my absolute heartland. So smaller suppliers to retailers work out who they are. You know, that's a, a simple Googleable thing to do. Speak to recruiters, speak about FMCG suppliers. That's where you will find the biggest category management opportunities. Um, Vicky, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, and I think it's like there are like it, it, working as a, um, a buyer or starting at that kind of level in, in actual supermarkets and retailers is a good way into category management because while you need to sort of develop slightly different skills, actually that gives you, you know, like Helen, talk, you're then in, you're in the thick of it and you're seeing that stuff and you're seeing what's happening. So that can be um, a routine. But I think, I mean, I think category management is something that I never even knew it existed, to be honest, until I moved into FMCG and it's such an interesting role and career and I think you know Helen does perhaps does herself a bit of a disservice because I think she's much more than it, it's it's all the stuff she talked about but it's actually about being a great researcher being great at insight understanding product development understanding brand and marketing because you're you know you're essentially um you're essentially helping uh, retailers understand how to categorize their stores and where to put products and what the criteria should be for which products go in and don't go on and and basically you know category managers are the gatekeepers for um we had a bit of a debate about who should go first because we we're saying just brand come first you develop but actually like you know category management is the gatekeeper for what products are actually going to get listed and also even for businesses like Arla they're the gatekeeper for for what what's going to be prioritized in terms of the the brands and products that are being sold because it should be led by what you're going to get listings for and sell essentially so. 
go into stores and open your eyes, go into Boots, for example, and have you'll see so much category management in evidence in Boots. So the big, um, sorry, I forgot this is national, I thought I was teaching students again, but go into a large Boots store and have a look at the way they've grouped products together. It's so interesting and it's evolving post-pandemic phenomenally. So, you know, buckle up, this is gonna be even more exciting. Do you have another question? Have we got time? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, we've got a question from somebody who said that they have graduated with a degree in psychology. They obtained that back in 2009 um, and they're currently finishing their level for professional marketing and digital professional marketing with CIM. Well done. Um, well done. And they want to it's know. Psychology and marketing. Yep. I, I, I thought, yeah, it's good, good plug for CIM, but I thought, I, I thought psychology and, and, and um, a CIM qualification would be a really good blend. Uh, but they're asking um, how to get into the world of marketing. They're excited by it and uh, they'd love to get a pointer. Where do you start? Well, I think I mean we've kind of covered it to an extent. I think I, I mean I think that's that is kind of <clears throat> it's looking. I think I mean the best thing to do is to think about the kinds of brands that interest you and that you would like to work on, or the kinds of categories that you'd like to work on, and write to them because. Um, as, you, as you sort of said, when you kind of going into a recruitment process with like hundreds of other, I mean, we used to have hundreds of, of applications for our graduate program at Arla. It's very difficult to stand out. But actually, if you get a letter from someone that says, look, I love your brand and I'm, I'm so interested in it. And this is something I've observed. And this is something if I was working on it, this is something I'd look at, which I did get somebody do once. I interviewed them and they got the job because you, you, you kind of want someone that's showing that genuine passion in your brand that you've got that, that that and that you think might see something different and do something differently so I think kind of thinking about who you want to work for and why you want to work for them and then actually doing some direct approaches is good advice mm -hmm. and or trying to get work experience in those businesses so that you can get a bit of experience to put on your CV um, but but yeah kind of what we talked about I think before it's you know not being afraid to take a role that might not be ideal but it's going to start to help you build the right competencies or thinking about the competencies that you've got that translate and how it gives you an edge. If you've got a degree in psychology, I think thinking about how you can position yourself as um, how that insight and understanding consumers and consumer behaviours and motivations is the absolute like critical for me sort of part of marketing. Um, I think you know you can show how you potentially have an advantage in that area through through your degree and the work you've done. So I'd be thinking about how you can talk about that and, and demonstrate that. I certainly have in the past particularly tried to recruit psychology students because um, it's quite useful, particularly if you've not got a big budget for doing consumer research in terms of that background. So, sorry, Helen. I, I think it's absolutely, I've, I'm really passionate about, you know, my degree was business, not marketing. It didn't really touch on marketing that much. And I think that your first degree or your first qualifications, they complement each other, but you don't have to follow a traditional marketeer's route because there isn't one. And like Vicky said, as long as you can show the spark, the passion, the enthusiasm, that's what will get you further ahead on your journey. Follow the brands, like Vicky said, that you like, that you admire, and be able to talk passionately about them. Have a Little Moons, a Colin and Cuthbert, a Sustainable Feminine Hygiene, uh, Outdoorables, Anchor. Have these brands, that these stories, that you love and have them ready to go. Have you seen what Colin's done now? Have you seen what's happening with this? This is trending on TikTok. You need to have that natural curiosity because let's be realistic, the jobs won't get handed to you. You have to go out and you have to constantly chip away at it. It isn't easy and I massively feel for you know people starting out, but isn't it exciting that you've got all of these things to go for? So just keep going, don't give up and find mentors. So if you look at CIM, if, you know, lots of mentors available there. Find people who challenge you, who make you accountable. So a little tip for me. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from somebody who's in their first year of business management degree. Uh, they're keen to pursue a career in digital marketing. So Helen, you just sort of touched on this a little bit, uh, but do, they, do you recommend doing a CIM qualification? Well, um, I, working for CIM obviously would. I'm, I'm very biased. But uh, we are seeing lots of uh, business students. Uh, we've just had a, a psychology student now who's given an example of doing CIM qualification. Helen and Vicky have both done their CIM qualifications. And I think it was Vicky who touched on earlier about um, CIM quals basically giving you um, a practical application. 
um, in order to take those sort of skills and, and tools into your into your role. So any sort of academic achievements you have can be complemented by a CIM qualification. But is there anything, Helen or, or, or Vicky, you want to add to that? I, I, I'm not finished, you know, I'm, I'm still studying now for another qualification and I find that if you're the kind of person that thinks you need that, so that's one train of uh, school of thought, if you want qualifications, if you want to do that, fantastic and I think CIM is the gr a great place to do a digital qualification. By the same token, don't beat yourself up if that's not for you, you can still access CIM content and thought leadership. You know, I actually came to a conclusion the other day. I thought, actually, I'm not sure I will study again because, you know, I'm running a business, I'm teaching, I've got a life. Um, you know, and so I thought maybe I have come to the end of that learning journey, but I thought I'll still keep going on the non-traditional routes through CIM. So mentoring, things like that. So it just depends what you're, you want to get out of it. A qualification alone will not get you where you need to go. You have to have the mindset and the passion to get there. Vicky, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, I, I've already talked about why I think CIM, I, like I say, I don't particularly look at whether, even though I've got two marketing degrees, I'm more interested in whether somebody has done something like CIM because I think it's more practical. If, if somebody is at the beginning of their, you know, their career, if I'm trying to recruit someone who hasn't got any experience, doesn't have any work experience, then that's perhaps when I would look more at their qualifications. And particularly, I'd be interested in whether they have a CIM qualification because I think they've got half a chance of actually being able to do the job um, because it's about practical application. I think if you're further if you're later in your career like um helen and i old uh, old timers um i think i think then it's it's a different thing so i think that doing some of those um we i'm the same we both still do qualifications and learning but i'm not really doing that to get a job because I, I think people stop looking at your qualifications when you get to um your sort of second or, or, or third job um it's more like what gets you through the door but my motivations are different is because i, I just want to get better at what I do or there's areas that are new or that I'm interested in um, and I'm doing it for myself and my own development to make me a different marketer so I think it, if it's about getting a job I think that CIM qualifications are really um, good when you're early in your career um, I would did you say digital yes Funny. yeah I, what I would just say about digital is I, I would be this is something I've got a bit of a bugbear about I would be really cautious about specializing in digital marketing really early in your career because to be honest in my opinion I don't think there's such a thing as digital marketing because marketing is not communications communications is one part of marketing and digital is one part of communications and I think if you specialize in digital communications too early in your career you end up then only ever being able to work in communications and probably for agencies and in digital communications potentially i would really encourage people to do broader marketing roles and, broad, and understand the full what marketing is about in its entirety and then if you decide you want to specialize in an area of marketing whether that be communications or digital communications or product development and mpd which i know helen has a really strong background um in doing previously you, if, if you want to specialize in an area then do it then but just i wouldn't do that too early in your career i don't think there's any harm doing a qualification in it to to sort of boost your knowledge in that area because people it's an area people are interested in but if you you know if, if you want to work in a brand management role for example for for, a, for an fmcg business you, i mean you're never going to be doing that you're they need somebody who can who can manage the brand and you're gonna have agencies doing your digital marketing so um so yeah do it as a, it depends what you most exactly to what helen said it depends a bit what your motivations are just to add to that as well as you were talking vicky i thought i thought back to what you said earlier in the um presentation I think the digital qualification would be really good to do if you are working, not necessarily in digital, but to add to your skills. So both Vicky and I studied independently whilst working um, with CIM, and that was what was great about it. At the time, I, did, I studied mine at night at Leeds Metropolitan University all those years ago. And Vicky, you did the same with your degree. And But I was working at the same time, so it felt like two streams pushing together. What I would say is if you're coming out of uni and you're going straight into another qualification, you pro you need to be still thinking about work experience. It's, it's, it's enrichment all the time. It's not one or the other. It has to be both. Yeah, I agree. Can I, uh, just, just touching on that point, because we, we have got another question around sort of whether to go into digital marketing, uh, because somebody's basically saying that uh, they're coming from an international management um, degree. 
um, but they are interested in getting into marketing. And, and they're basically saying that because they've, they've begun a, an online course in digital marketing, um, because they haven't got work experience, um, is that is that a good idea? Basically, and I, I would say that the um, doing doing a, a, any course is is brilliant and, and certainly can open doors, give you new skills, and it definitely um, looks good on the CV as well. But in terms of work experience, there's no substitute for that. Um, and doing any course, um, unless it's got a really uh, sort of pl practical element where you're working on a project um, that, that's been uh, given by by an employer. Um, you're not going to get that work experience. So um, it depends which line of work you want to go into, of course. Um, but just touching on, on Helen and, and Vicky's point there about um, having that traditional marketing skills set and those qualifications to back it up, um, as well as digital, if you want to complement that. Are you talking from an FMCG perspective, or would you say that that is across the market? Across Vicky? The I mean, I, I personally, I think it's across the market. I, I think that um, if you, if you, if it, as with the way that CIM teach it, marketing is not communications. That's a part of marketing. Um, I think digital I think the problem is, is that in another few years' time, all communications are going to be digital because every channel is going to be digitalized. So then, what a digital, you know? I, I just think that um, communications is a discipline. There are really specific elements of communication that are digital, and if you want to be a social media manager or you want to work. Um, particularly in SEO or an area like that that's specialist, then you absolutely need to have specialist digital knowledge, which I, you know, I don't have. I would I would employ somebody to do that stuff for me. That's what you want to do, absolutely. They're the kinds of qualifications that you need to do to be able to specialise in that area and be good at it because those people are specialists. Um, it's, all I'm saying is it's really about thinking about where you want to take your career because if you specialise too early, it could just potentially be limiting for you. Um, I think you do get, um, as I talked about with my career, you, you quickly get put in a box. So um, if all your experience is in, in one very um, specialised discipline of marketing, it would be very difficult for you to, to get into senior roles or, 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 or expand your, um, uh, you know, you, it would be very difficult to go from that kind of role to a marketing director or a brand manager role because you're only doing a part of the puzzle. So it's not that it's a good or a bad thing, it's just about, I would be wary about it's it's a specialism, and I'd be wary about specialising too early in my career. I, I suppose is, is the point that I'm making. But if you're absolutely sure that's a specialism you want to work in, then go for your life. <laughs> um, if you are a student, challenge your motivation for doing it, and speak to your tutors and see what they think of it. If you are working, speak to your manager as part of your development plan. You know, will they fund it? Will they support you to do it? Will they give you time off? Will they, you know? I don't know, give you other encouragement to do it. So it has to be for something. That's my recommendation for any further learning. It has to be part of a plan. As for digital marketing, you know, it, sometimes it can feel like if you don't have that qualification, you're being left behind. But actually, you can demonstrate digital skills from other CIM activities. I certainly do. I don't have a digital marketing qualification. Um, we were still using dial up. <laughs> when I studied so yeah yeah it's a, it's a fair point and I think there may be a, a misconception that when you graduate you stop learning and um, you, you certainly do continue to do CPD continual professional development um, there's lots of short courses some are free some are, some are costly some have um, accreditations attached to them and I, I would yeah. certainly encourage anybody who is going into marketing or any any profession to to continue down that pathway um, so next question we've got um, is around um, websites and apps, whether there's any that you can recommend to be updated in terms of marketing news, latest campaigns, et cetera. Um, well, well, CIM is exactly that kind of resource. Um, we are um, sort of custodians and, and producers of lots of marketing content and news. Um, we work across all sectors. And we're the we're the official body for, for for marketing, so it's no surprise that we churn out lots of uh, rich content. Um, and on the next slide, and, and the QR code that I put on there earlier is the, is a CIM newsletter, which is a really good free way to to keep up to date with with what's happening, particularly whilst whilst you're studying. But also, if you want to take that a little bit further, you could become um, a, a CIM member. And if you're studying at the moment. 
um, whether you're a, a student at university or considering doing a CIM qualification, um, for £65 you can, you can get access to a plethora of resources. But Helen, Vicky, I'm sure there's free things out there. And are there any apps or websites you, you want to plug? Um, well, I, I really enjoy it. I can't wait for Catalyst to come through, which is the CIM magazine. I, I do use that a lot. Um, and I've put stuff on Instagram about it. It's very interesting and I'm a bit retro. I get the print copy, I get a glass of wine and I sit down and I, I really enjoy reading it. And that's, I'm very candid, that's that's the honest truth. Um, but I, I really like, there's one called um, Cam City, which is K-A-M, uh, City, as in like Leeds. Um, and I, there's a lot of free content on there um, that I use for FMCG. Um, I follow Kanta, IRI, Nielsen, Dunhumby, uh, Nectar 360 on Instagram and you get snackable content on there. So remember what I said about the compost heap. I'll see something on Instagram that Nectar 360 have put out, which is really great content. And I'll remember that, you know, I will sign up to their free webinars. I will try and get into anything like that that I think is, you know, going to enrich my FMCG wider knowledge. You. You have to find your own apps and websites because not everything works for everybody, but you'll find your own compost teeth. Am I making sense about compost? But anyway, <laughs> Vicky, add on that. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think um, the Grocer campaign, Marketing Week, uh, the Drum, those sorts of people are great to follow on linkedin and, and and check out we've already talked about link it linkedin and like helen said i think i think it's like particularly with linkedin following brands that you're interested in and sectors that you're interested in that will give you inspiration following people like simon sinek mark ritson those kinds of people um uh, seth goldwyn you know all these people on linkedin and they're constantly creating content and and putting free talks on um youtube and stuff that are, that are really um useful but i think there's not really a substitute for getting yourself out to store to be honest um i think you know you can look at you can read what people are doing on um on uh, in articles or on apps but actually there's no substitute for getting yourself you should be looking at the different retailers and looking at what brands are doing and looking at what's up and what's being picked up and watching how people are buying them um and, and sort of seeing that and the same with marketing you know looking at you know uh TikTok, you know all these kinds of like growing channels facebook look what are brands doing on these channels what you know how what are the things that cut through what are the things that stand out to you and engage with you and um, I don't think there's any kind of substitute for for just looking and, and learning um, rather than listening Ch to what other people are saying about what you should be doing. Chances are you're already doing a lot of it with the people you follow. So follow people like Jim Shark, you know, Reddit, go on to Reddit and look for top 10 influencers, top 10 FMCG brands. You know, you can get such a lot of information already out there and build a tweet deck. So a tweet deck is where you follow the right influencers on uh, marketing it so seth lilac people like that build a tweet deck and put different categories in it i found that incredibly useful um again compost um so yeah but spend time in store you know if you haven't been thrown out of a wilkinson you've not made it in your career in my opinion you had your phone confiscated or your photos taken off yet <laughs> you've not made it <laughs> 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 Me and Helen have been stopped quite a lot of taking pictures in retailers and told to leave. Yeah. <laughs> Delete all the pictures. <laughs> Perhaps we can do another session later on how to avoid security guards and things like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, we've, we've got about uh, three minutes left, uh, so probably time just for one more question. Any questions that are unanswered, um, we'll um, we'll share with, with the speakers and we'll, we'll try and get those back to you. Um, and thanks everybody for questions. But so the last last question I'm going to ask um, Helen and Vicky is uh, an important role of brand manager is to understand strategy, um, even devise a strategy. Um, do you recommend or do you have any sort of separate strategy um, for uh, P example, um, product strategy, promotional strategy? So you talked about brand, but what about uh, product strategy, promotional strategy, pricing? Um, place strategy yeah I mean I, I think that's that is part of so a brand strategy for me the, the, the structure is your what are your object you have your commercial objectives you have your marketing objectives which is it's what are the consumer behavior changes you need to make to, to hit those commercial objectives 
who are you targeting your audience and and in terms of their uh, needs and desires in terms of your product your positioning um, and your positioning is the things that I talked about it's your um, it's the the need that you're meeting and the type of product you have and your codes and ass distinctive codes and assets then underneath that you have how are you going to make how are you going to get that consumer to buy that product to hit those targets you have your four so your four p's basically your pricing strategy your product you know, your, your development product strategy and what your mpd would be and what the rules are for your for your products in terms of, of the, the the things that they need to do to to meet that proposition you have your communication strategy which is obviously marketing and, and and communications and your distribution strategy where are you going to be trying to sell your product and then you have your kpis and that is a marketing strategy so all those elements that you talked about are part of the marketing strategy it should be defined by the brand manager and all my brand strategies and all my marketing strategies have all that that is that's basically the structure that's what i develop that's what i do um, and that's what I do now for businesses. I, I work that top bit out for them and then I tell them what their strategy needs to be to deliver, you know, against all, all those four P areas. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's part of the marketing strategy, I would say, rather than a, a separate thing. Brilliant. There's some, there's some templates on um, the CIM Content Hub um, for if you are just starting out with strategy and strategy building, there's some quite good templates on CIM Hub, which will help you focus a little bit, but I recommend a little bit of SOSTAC, which is a Smart Insights concept. If you go on to Smart Insights, they've got, I think they've got the most reputable strategies on there, um, like a, a download. And also I recommend the Strategizer series. Yeah, that's really good, Strategizer. Yeah. So that's just that's all I can recommend because Vicky smashed that one. Um, so we do we do have more questions. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll we'll try and get those answered uh, um, again at another time. Uh, perhaps an email, or we can reach out to you another way. But uh, thank you everybody for for joining today. Thank you especially to to Helen and Vicky for some really insightful uh, presentations there and hanging around for the Q and A. Um, so I just like to say yeah, thank you both and. Um, Enjoy the rest of your day. And here is that QR code I mentioned in case you want to uh, subscribe and, and learn a little bit more about CIM.